Ole Miss only allowed 46 points to Mississippi State and 50 to a and um, You guys obviously have been scoring pretty good your last, I guess, game and a half anyway. What, what, what's your take on what Ole Miss is, on Ole Miss's defense and what, they're, what they did to shut those teams down last week? Yeah, Bob, I think, you know, first of all, Coach Davis, you know, he's a great coach. Uh, they control tempo. Um, you know, they pride themselves on the defensive side of the floor. Uh, and anytime, you you know, you score points offensively or defensively or you limit somebody offensively or defensively, uh, it's kind of both sides of the ball. So, if um, you know, if, if, if you have low scoring games, um, you know, defensively, it's probably semi low scoring on offense too. So, um, you know, they're going to, they're going to mix up their defenses. We know that they played some one, three, one late game against us last year. And we got some great looks out of it. Um, you know, we went back and watched that game and, and they went with their one, three, one late in the game. And, and, uh, we got two really good looks, uh, from three point land. They seem to be a little bit more aggressive in their in their one three one this year. That also morphs back into a two three zone, um, you know. So I think just for us, you know, same thing. It, it is most nights really really take care of the ba- basketball, uh, understand what their themes are in the game. They have, you know, two really really good guards. Uh, Schuler can really score the ball. An experienced player joiner a transfer from bakersfield can can really shoot mid-range pull up off the bounce jump shots uh and then Romello white insides very very good around the rim a post-up player an offensive rebounder and then buffin uh can beat people off the dribble and score around the rim i know last game i, I think moses said i think maybe you did too you guys put in some some new uh cuts and some different things offensively i guess take advantage of andy's defense is that something you can do against Ole Miss's defense or anybody's defense game to game or at this stage of the season, is it hard to put in new stuff? No, we added quite a bit of stuff, Bob, prior to the Vanderbilt game as far as moving without the ball and felt like, uh, you know, maybe maybe they focused on the ball a little bit and, and maybe some backdoor cuts against any denials would work. And, um, you know, certainly, um, you know, we have a one three one attack that we used last year, but we, we did spend the most of the morning uh, with some alterations or some slight variations to that offense um, as well. So I think that, you know, we know that they run that, you know, anywhere from two to 15 to 17 times a game. And, and um, you know, when the ball gets in certain spots of the floor, they fall back into a two, three or potentially a man. And, and they do that after some made baskets. So, um, but, but at the end of the day, you're going to have to go out and play you know, and, and, and make plays, not turn the ball over and get high quality shots. And then, you know, both teams have won two in a row in the SEC for the first time. So it seems like you're both playing pretty well. Kind of what, what's your take on how both teams are playing right now coming into this game? Yeah, I think Ole Miss is, is confident. Um, like I said, they're really well coached, uh, got experience backcourt. Romello White's got a ton of experience playing it in the Pac-12 at Arizona State. He's a physical player inside. Um, you know, Buffin's a really good player. I mean, I, you know, I, I like their team. I mean, they have really good pieces. They pride themselves on defense and um, some of the little things like getting loose balls and long rebounds are, are going to be really important as well. Okay. I got a couple more. I'll turn it back to Mike. Thanks. Nate. Damn it. Would Eric, would uh, Ole Miss be a team that maybe you'd press a little bit or at least increase the half court pressure just to try and uh, up the tempo? Yeah, I mean, they'll run, uh, Nate, a little bit more than maybe what, you know, you're looking at their scores. I mean, Schuler uh, is, is really effective in transition. We don't want to um, give up numbers to them. Certainly, you know, pace of play is – is, is a factor for us, um, but we're not going to all of a sudden implement, you know, a new press, but we do have, you know, two different presses that we've used at times um, to either slow somebody down or to speed it up, Nate. So, um, you know, I think the biggest thing is we don't want, you know, Schuler and Joyner to get easy looks, um, you know, by over extending our defense too much, but, um, you know, certainly even against Auburn, you know, some type of, of, of three quarters court defense could potentially 
uh, you know, come into play depending on how the flow of the game's going. Do you look to kind of similar rotations as, as the last game against Ole Miss? Yeah, I mean, I think the players dictate, you know, I don't know who's going to get in foul trouble. I don't know who's not going to get in foul trouble on Monday at, at uh, 208. I, I don't know who's going to make shots out of the gate. Um, and so I think that there's so many things, Nate, that go into, you know, what exactly your rotation is going to be, how guys are defending certain people uh, comes into play. Sometimes guys will come out of the game because they aren't guarding their position. Some guys are late to weak side rotation. Some guys get winded. So um, I feel like we kind of know what our subbing flow will go and then how extended it becomes depends on all all of the above, I guess. Thank you. Curtis. Hey, Coach, you mentioned the different looks from Ole Miss defensively, maybe particularly against the zone. Obviously, you have a couple of days to really focus in on what they do, but how do you feel like you've executed as a team against some of those similar looks that you've seen? Yeah, I mean, really, it, you know, up to this point, and again, every personnel is different, meaning, you know, we haven't played Ole Miss, so um, – you know, not sure how it, how it'll play out. I mean, we, we, you know, we do have a, a plan of attack, but it, you know, doesn't matter what your plan is. If it, you know, if it's, if it's not executed or, um, you know, you're going to have to meet the pass, you're going to have to know how to step through traps. Um, you're going to have to know how to play with a window, meaning shoulder to shoulder, knee to knee when you have the ball in your hands and that's, that's a window and, and uh, stepping through the trap and coming to meet the ball and throwing passes on ropes are all some of the little theme type terminology that we'll use for this game. Coach. Yeah, coach, you kind of touched on it there where you're talking about the rotations and everything that goes into it. And, you know, it depends on matchups. But I know, you know, Connor played 18 minutes the other night, hadn't played much before that. Jalen Williams went from playing all 20 minutes of the second half to only nine. Is this the kind of flexibility that you kind of envisioned when you put this roster together this offseason? I think, you know, for sure, Hutch, like when, you know, Connor's just, I mean, he's different. He's, you know, he's seven foot three. And so when you have a player, uh, that's so unique because I mean, how often are we playing against someone over seven foot in league play? Not often. So, um, so it is going to be dictated a little bit on matchups and it's going to be dictated on, you know, are we getting an advantage with Connor on the floor, whether it's offensively or defensively. And then with Jalen, I mean, he's one of our most physical defenders. And so when we play against physicality, we need him out on the floor. We didn't feel, uh, you know, against a Vandy team where they had their four and five out on the floor a lot um, playing at the, at the three point line that, you know, that maybe he had to be in there banging on that particular game. And, and, and we needed Connor to play extended minutes because he, he hadn't in a while. So it was really important uh, for him to get back out on the flow of things as well. Troy. Yeah, coach, uh, we were talking with Moses Moody after the Vanderbilt game, and he said you guys as a team passed the ball around 218 times, obviously 22 assists in the game. But is that amount of passes what you're kind of looking for each game? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think anytime we get over 200 passes, we, you know, we feel good. We feel like the ball's got eyes, the ball's being shared. Um, you know, anything under 200, we got to go back on the film and, and review why and where did the ball get sticky. Um, but I, I thought for the most part, every single guy and what happens sometimes is when you start sharing it and guys start making shots, um, you know, the, 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 the ball seems to find more hands. And sometimes when you're struggling, uh, you know, we'll have some guys that try to do too much alone. So anyway, yeah, I thought we did a great job passing the ball. Scotty. Hey, Coach, you mentioned on Saturday, I think, in your interview with SEC Network after the game that Jalen Tate is a little bit of an underrated score. I guess what qualities do you see in him as a score that can you know make him effective and lead to games like he had Saturday? Yeah, I think, number one, when he gets in the teeth of the defense, he's got a good floater. He's got a good mid-range game, much like Jimmy Witt did. 
Um, you know, they, they kind of get him in different ways. You know, Tate has the ability maybe to use the dribble a little bit more into his mid range shots and, and start off in a pick and roll set and then kind of uh, get his way into his mid range game. But he's also a, a reliable three point shooter as well. And I think that opens up some of the stuff for he and his teammates. And then just drawing the toughest defensive assignment every night makes him really valuable. And, um, you know, he gets, he's a high deflection player from the defensive end. And, he, and he's a guy that is always trying to, you know, like, how can I get my teammates involved as well? I think you mentioned his perimeter shot. He hit five threes last week. That's probably his best, you know, perimeter shooting week of the season. How, how important is that for this offense? Yeah. I mean, I think when he's knocking down open shots, you know, when people help on other players and, and, and he's knocking stuff down, I think it's, it's really important. And we've seen, we've seen it behind closed doors, just, um, you know, his ability to continue to get better, both from a competence standpoint and then just from a repetition standpoint in, in practice, he keeps getting better. Um, yeah, Eric, obviously, you know, a lot of teams are, are getting transfers these days. You're, you're, you're kind of out ahead, ahead of that parade, it looks like. But, um, you know, White and Joyner for them are, are transfers. You've obviously got a lot of transfers who are contributing, a lot of starting. I think every, all the transfers have started at one point or another. Just well, what's your take on the transfer players in this game? Yeah, I mean, White is – I mean, he was a really good player at Arizona State. Um a really good player and talking to PAC 12 coaches um, you know, they thought his, his scoring around the rim, his offensive rebounding, his ability to block shots. Um, you know, he's a really, really, really good player with a lot of experience coming from another power five conference. Um, and then Joyner, uh, you know, could really score the ball at Bakersfield. Um, you know, he's, I think he's improved. He's got a pull up game where he can stop on a dime off the dribble and make shots so I think both those guys uh you know along with Schuler and Buffin uh, you know make them a really tough cover and then your, your transfers how would you say they, they've done this season as a group or if you want to break them down individually however you want to answer that yeah I think they've done great I mean obviously you know with with Justin it's 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 been you know a little bit of the injury setback, but he's, you know, he's one of the best offensive rebounders in the country. Um, you know, he's the, the offense flows when he's on the floor, like when he's in our trail spot, he does a really good job of just understanding because he's so smart, how to utilize the second side of the floor with the pass. Uh, he makes us much better defensively because he can just, we can just assign him to an upfront player. We don't have to worry about over helping when he's guarding the guy, just like with Tate. Um, you know, Tate, we assign him to a player. It's usually the best perimeter, not usually, it is the best perimeter player. And for the most part, he's held those guys under their averages every night without giving extra help. So, um, and then with Vance, I mean, he's a guy that stretches the floor out for us. He's made two really good passes, one in each of the last two games, kind of momentum passes, one, you know, one with the lob last game. Um, and, and he's, he's a guy that, you know, at six foot nine, uh, adds a different dimension to us, not just being a shooter, but he gives us more length on the floor as well. And then, you know, C C Connor and, and uh, JD are transfers too. What I know they've been kind of up and down, but. Yeah, no, I think Connor's done a great job. I mean, you know, I, I feel a little bit bad for him because he had such a great summer and then he had the setback, you know, losing weight, um, trying to get back healthy. Uh, but I think he's played really well. He needs, to, you know, Connor needs to continue at his size to uh, go down in the block and create an advantage at seven foot three with some back to the basket stuff. And, and um, you know, that's up to him to come to the coaches and ask for uh, post practice post work. Um, you know, we go to him a lot with it and, and um, you know, he needs to, to, to go down there and, and, and utilize his jump hook a little bit. Um, and not just float on the perimeter at seven foot three for us because he does have a great size advantage. He does have a excellent touch around the rim, and, and I think he lost a little of that when he lost his 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 weight because it was so significant this you know this off season right 
around September. Um, and then JD, uh, you know, he's our, he's our one guy that can, you know, he can get a shot at any time. It might not be a good shot, um, but he has the ability to get a shot off late shot clock. He's got to continue to learn um, when he's at that point guard position to, to involve his teammates more. He needs to understand what a good shot is compared to a great shot. Um, but part of the development that we thought was going to happen uh, coming from Jacksonville and being such a high usage and high volume player, um, you know, it, from a lower conference. What was there, Ramilla White? Was he a guy you guys uh, expressed interest in or checked out or whatever? We did. It went nowhere. He just wasn't in. He wasn't interested. Oh, sorry. I, I might guess to unmute me, but I, I think I'm okay. But thanks. Troy, final question? Yeah, Coach, I know this is a little kind of off topic, but uh, tomorrow is the um, mark. It's the one year where Kobe Bryant and his daughter passed away. I was curious, you know, how that impacted your team last year and what Kobe as a player kind of meant to you. Yeah, I mean, you know, for, for our team, I think that, it, you know, so many of our guys, if not the entire roster, you know, he's a guy that they've looked up to. He's a guy that, that everybody knows about what his work ethic was and, and his belief um, in himself and how he used the offseason to become a, you know, the great, one of the greatest players of all time. I think for many of us, you know, um, you know, we started to learn about him as a father and how close he was with, with his daughters. Um, so I think for, you know, I obviously coached against Kobe and tried to come up with game plans against him. And, um, you know, he was gracious in, in, in signing a lot of stuff for me over the years. I know Matthew and Michael, my two sons, ha each have a pair of shoes that he signed and he was nice enough to do that. And, you know, I mean, I got a lot of stories from just coaching the Lakers G League team and being in the same building with them, whether it be in the weight room or after one of our G League games coming out to the parking lot. And there was no other car out there but, but, but my own and his. He rolled down the window and asked if anybody else was in the gym because he wanted to go get work in without anybody else being in there. Um, so a lot of a lot of little stories. But I think for our guys, it was it was a shock as it was to everybody. But. But we used it as a time for guys to just get up in front of each other and talk about um, anything that they learned from him or, you know, to, to also talk about grief. Because some of our guys really were shook up, um, you know, more so than, than maybe what, you know, the general public would even know.